Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of the New Mexico Mercury. We're here today in our library with environmental historian, author, and friend Virginia Scharf, who is director of the Center for the Southwest at the University of New Mexico and a new associate provost for a great number of things. <laughs> Uh, and the author of numerous books. Among her latest is uh, uh, The Women Jefferson Loved and the wonderful eye-opening book we're going to talk about today, uh, Seeing Nature Through Gender. In a world that looks like it's destroying itself with pollution and the atmospheric overheating that comes with that, it's vital for us to start to think about what we've done wrong. And one wrong road we've taken, I think, has to do with the fact of gender-biased environmental analyses and historical narratives. Biased in the sense that they tend to see human relationships with the environment exclusively through the doings of human males, uh, virtually leaving out half of the world's pop human population. So it's an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us today to talk about these complicated and interesting matters. Well, thanks, Baird, for inviting me to talk about this book. Uh, it's one that um, I had been thinking about a long time before I put it together, and then I recruited basically every environmental historian that I could find who was working on the subject of how we think about gender and environmental history. And I have to tell you, pretty much all of them are in there, because this hasn't been, I think, a perspective that's been super influential in the field of environmental history, although thinking about gender analysis, about the ways in which we think of um, the ways in which we construct masculinity and femininity really shapes our thinking in ways we m almost aren't aware of. It's like a fish not thinking about the water it swims in, or, you know, it's like writing a history of air. You could write history without air in it, but you can't have history without air in it. And so I think in the same way, uh, we have made our history in gender terms, but we don't think about it. And we certainly, for the most part, take for granted the gender terms in which we think about nature and about the human relationship with nature. So this is going to be a fascinating hour or so. The uh, uh, language, I think, could be said uh, in large part to determine perception, and by determining perception, uh, therefore determining behavior to a certain degree. Um, so when one uses the male generic, uh, which you might explain to us a little bit, uh, when speaking about the environment in particular, this has powerful implications uh, in regards to our behavior toward the environment and in the environment. Could you talk a little bit about the use of man when referring to humanity? Well, I started thinking about the use of uh, the, the notion of man um, as a kind of shorthand for human beings. When I first started reading uh, feminist theory and reading about um, all the kinds of things that uh, people like Mary Wollstonecraft or Simone de Beauvoir or some of the more recent feminists had written about humans' relations with each other and also with other things. And among the problems with thinking about humanity as a man, uh, well, there are a couple of them. One is that it makes humanity singular. And human beings have a very, very wide variety of relationships um, to nature. I mean, we know that, for example, Americans use a hell of a lot more of what we have on the planet than people in many, many other uh, countries, particularly in developing countries. So we are, you know, a, whatever, a tenth of the world's population and use a third of its resources, or I'm not sure exactly what it is. And I think thinking in terms of man aggregates human beings in ways that maybe we need to disaggregate them. We need to think about the different ways. So the people who use a lot or the people who have a heavy impact or the people who are doing particular kinds of things that we think of as being either better or worse for the planet, um, we can hold them in particular accountable rather than just saying human beings are all bad, man is bad for the world. Um, another problem with it is that when you're talking about man, you never know whether using man generic or man specific. Right. So the idea that man um, stands for women or woman um, or man stands for everyone, I think um, masks a lot of the relationships that we've developed th in very, very gendered terms through nature. So uh, that's part of the problem. But I think the other thing that happens is that if we have a singular thing called man um, that interacts with this singular thing called nature, um, one thing that ends up happening, because we always pair 
male and female when we think in gender terms. Nature becomes a female. Nature becomes kind of passive. Nature becomes something that's always reacted upon. Yeah. And uh, man becomes this thing that has the potential to transform or exploit or use or protect or pre provide for or preserve um, nature. And I'm not sure it's ever that simple. Um, and I don't really think nature should be subsumed into one thing either. I think uh, everything from cockroaches to hurricanes um, turns into this kind of girl in the <laughs> idea of man and nature. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. So I think if we kind of go backstage behind those terms, we unpack a whole lot of complex stuff that's worth unpacking and then taking in very um, careful historical terms. I, being a historian, I always like to do that anyway. So I know that the that the answer to this question I'm going to ask is impossible to embrace. But when you leave out half half of humanity in discussing human relationships with the environment, what do you leave out? For example, I mean, are there a few? I mean, I mean, there must be some prominent examples in this ocean of things that that are left out. Could you tell us a little bit? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, I, I think to begin with, we, we are only barely scratching the surface of what we haven't looked at because we've only been looking at half of humanity. Okay, so um, there are many things that we ignore when we ignore what women do or uh, how women act or the, the ways in which we understand nature in gender terms. Uh, in, there are myriad kinds of ways of trying to ask the questions about what are we missing here. Yeah. I've looked at a few of them. So I would say the first thing that I would want to talk about is that we focus on big things big processes. What happens when you build a dam? Uh, what happens when you build a bomb? What happens when you engineer a city? And so these kind of mega macro kinds of things become obvious uh, targets of inquiry for, for thinking about the history of human relations with things humans haven't made. And I think those are really important things. And I think it's possible to write very wonderful books about them or to think about, you know, I think it's important to think about dams and cities and bombs. That's There's no doubt about that. But more often our relationships with the things that we haven't made or built, with, with nature, with the flora and fauna and minerals around us, take place in much smaller scale interactions. They take place at the micro level. They take place at the intimate level. They maybe take place at the level of our bodies, right? So the act of having a baby, right, is yes. an intimate thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what relationship do we have with nature when we reproduce ourselves as biological entities and what kinds of dis decisions go into that? Yeah. Uh, we really haven't thought about that except in terms of things like a population bomb, which turns a baby into something on the scale of a bomb. And I'm not sure that those decisions get made that way. Um, every time nations try to create population policies, they certainly have consequences, but most of the time make, people make decisions about human reproduction, which is an extraordinarily important environmental act on an intimate scale and for reasons that have to do more with the level of a household, say, than they do with the level of a nation. Yeah. You and I, when we had our children, were not thinking about the future of the United States of America. <laughs> I am willing to bet on that. I'm willing to bet that too. And another thing that, that we ha don't really think about when we really focus on what men do is um, anything that happens behind the doors of a household. Right. Anything that happens uh, within the family, anything that in the case of the modern United States of America right now has to do with what we think of as being relations of consumption or the point of consumption. Mm -hmm. So we can write Bill Cronin, for example, wrote a brilliant book called Nature's Metropolis, which is about the transformation of uh, the ways in which we use plants and animals as, as a consequence of the rise of the city of Chicago, the relation of the city with its hinterland and so on. But so we see hogs and we see wheat and we see corn and we see all of these things coming into Chicago and being transformed by these incredibly complex um, na um, nationwide um, transportation and production networks and the mechanization of agriculture and the new uses of land. But what happens once it gets to the household? What difference does it make that uh, the people inside that household happen to be women and why are they not interesting environmental actors? And I, I guess I would say if there's no demand, 
then it doesn't matter what we're supplied. If there's nobody using it, if there's nobody transforming it, um, then those relations of forces and relations of production would come to a grinding halt. So we need to understand what kinds of things uh, inspire people to, to consume the things they do to transform the things they consume into what way they are consumable. I promise you, very few people in Chicago ate raw steak. What happened? Why did they want fire in their household and or transformation of fire into electricity? Uh, why coal power dams? The, the demand end really matters. Um, and then we were talking a little bit earlier, you and I just uh, off camera, about, about waste. And I think looking at environmental history and looking at human relations with nature in terms exclusively of what men do, do tends to put a lot of the question about how we dispose of the products of what we do uh, off stage. Um, and that's certainly the case in the household. So when we think about, for example, that wonderful moment in that episode of Mad Men where the Draper family goes for a picnic and, they, and they're done with the picnic and they, Don throws away his cigarette butt and then they pick up the um, the beer cans and all the the blanket with all the beer cans and the chicken legs and all that stuff on it, <laughs> and just flap the blanket and all the stuff flies onto the grass and then they fold up the blanket and walk away. <laughs> you know, this is a world in which, you know, a very male centered view of what's important in the world leaves a lot off the blanket. It's just wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful. So it's it's like if if um, you know if. If consumption and use and processing uh, are not looked at, it's like you know suddenly the ham comes to the front door and it goes bong and it bounces off. I mean, obviously <laughs> something something happens to it in a very important way. So this this same this same sort of uh, 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 almost comic. Uh, um, uh, failure to see the full picture also invades all kinds of science as well as you bring out wonderfully in this great story of the of, of the zebra finch and 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 how um, how when you look at them only through uh, the male generic you fail to see well half the story so would you mind telling us that story? Oh, I would love to tell that story. <laughs> so for a really long time I've been fascinated by the ways in which science absorbs the culture around it and is not the kind of objective, rationalist enterprise that scientists would like us to believe. I think science is a product of our culture, as is everything in the culture. And so I began to think about, okay, well, how does the gendering up of the world, how does a focus on male activity or the activity of males of whatever species, um, and how does the fact, this the kind of social fact that for a very long time, almost everybody who called themselves a scientist was a man. You know, you wouldn't be, even if you did the same thing, um, you know, looked at birds, looked at plants, looked at whatever. For a very long time, our definition of what a scientist was, was defined by um, also being male, yeah. right? You know, so even people doing the exact same kind of thing, if he might be a scientist, she might be a naturalist or, or whatever. So oh, there would yes. be another linguistic distinction that would, would creep in there. But yeah. um, I just started reading around to try to find, you know, examples of um, a focus on behavior of males of a species that I thought both imbibed a kind of cultural script from the world of science, you know, the, the, so, the social life of scientists. Uh -huh. And at the same time, also taught a kind of moral lesson about how species behaved and how we kind of might generalize from that. So there's a kind of a, and this has been happening since Darwin, you know, if um, if zebra finches behave in a particular way, we can now understand how men and women behave. There's always been that, that attempt to kind of, you know, rationalize one's own species behavior um, from thinking about other species. So there's this very famous uh, zoologist in Sheffield, England, um, named uh, Dr. Timothy Burkhead. And for years, he's been like the great recognized authority on a variety of bird species. But I, for reasons that I can no longer remember, began to read his work about sperm morphology in zebra finches. And by this, I mean, you know, uh, how are male zebra finches getting their sperm around? How fast is it moving? What are they doing? And what Dr. Burkhead was talking about was, you know, these zebra finches had long been thought to mate for life. 
Okay, they were they were thought to be a naturally monogamous species, and I think the Victorians liked that idea. Sure. They were the kind of scientists who said, well, you know, they, they these birds are lovely. You know, they made for life. They tell us something about how we ought to behave. Well, lo and behold, we get the sexual revolution, and guys like Dr. Burkhead are just like, oh, wait, you know, the males of this species are fooling around, you know, <laughs> and they're doing so for, for very good evolutionary reasons because they need to get more of their sperm around so that more of their offspring will survive so that they, you know, pass on their genes. It's this whole kind of selfish gene idea, the yeah. idea that, that the game that, that animals play is that they try, or, or plants for that matter, is to try to replicate themselves as broadly as possible. And so the theory had been that, you know, the males then were just, you know, everywhere and that the females were kind of waiting around for it to happen to them. And that what was particularly to me, you know, and I thought, well, has he even thought about what the females are up to? You know, because they're evidently just hanging out, you know, like <laughs> waiting to be discovered at Schwab's drugstore or something. <laughs> so the experimental methodology that he used was particularly bizarre. Um, and in some ways, you know, it, it resembled some of the kind of weird stuff that early scientists did because what they would do is they would take a freeze-dried female zebra finch, equip this um, thing with a computerized sperm tracker in her freeze-dried former vagina, right? You know, or I guess still. And then these male zebra finches, they would put them in isolation and then put them in with the freeze-dried dead thing, and they would repeatedly mate with them. Ooh. And I thought, well, that's maybe not an experimental <laughs> method that is un you know, that is beyond um, interrogation, let's say. You know, let's think about that. It, to what extent is this free-dried thing actually a female zebra finch? And, you know, doesn't this, I mean, aren't they at least, you know, hopping around while the, you know, males are coming after them? And the interesting part was, so Z Burkhead publishes a lot of this stuff about the randy male and the, you know, receptive female. And then he starts to get... Um, female doctoral students, female postdocs, women scientists in his lab who say, uh, you know, raise their hand, uh, Dr. Burkhead, you know, what about the girls here? You know, what about these female finches? And he's like, ah, oh, what a novel concept. <laughs> and he actually being an excellent scientist said, let's go observe the females in nature. And it turned out they're hopping off into the brush whenever they can. They're not mating for life either, right? Oh. So this opens up a whole brand new paradigm in ornithology. The idea, oh, you know, so first we have the sexually liberated, you know, sort of playboy male, right? You know, and then we have, you know, the kind of woman about town, you know, um, of the women's liberation era. And now what's interesting now is that, um, so Dr. Burkhead is now writing about, you know, everybody's promiscuous and sometimes, you know, to the disadvantage of the other sex and all this kind of thing. But it's just, it's opened up the universe of action. Sure. And I think that, you know, to me, that was an illustrative lesson. And I give him a lot of credit for, for changing his mind when somebody asked him a question that made his paradigm seem incapable of explaining everything it ought to be able to explain. That's one of the great stories, and it, and it makes the point so, so clearly. This, this, other, this other image that you used of, of uh, what happens when the door closes in the house, um, there's, um, you did in, in, uh, in your introduction, I believe, uh, you explained an analysis you did of your own carting around of groceries and other things to explain, uh, in some degree, part of what's missing when you don't look at the whole picture. Uh, and, and I thought it was really amazing because the numbers were quite staggering, really. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, that's totally true. And, and of course, you know, lots of people carrying around groceries, but nobody thinks about that category at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you talk a little bit about that, too? It's a little embarrassing for me to imagine that anybody would actually care about me carting around my groceries because <laughs> everybody carts around groceries. I mean, that's the funny part about it. But I, I did a kind of an exercise, a really mundane mathematical exercise to try to talk about a larger point. And, and the point is that when we think about environmental history only in terms of 
um, industrialized work processes, okay, only in terms of mass production, Big then I think, I think we miss a lot of the kind of work that has not been mechanized, work that has not been industrialized, work that has not been collectivized and not been put under one roof or, um, you know, disciplined in the same way that we think about, you know, what happened in the field or what happened in the factory. Um, there, and that there's still a lot of work that people do with muscle power. Right. So we try one of our um, most important transformations when we think about the Industrial Revolution and how that's changed our relationship with nature is we think about machines doing more work. But if we leave out the kind of work that now in our society, well, it's changing now a little bit. But, you know, for I would say most of the 20th century was predominantly women's work. There was a lot of that work that was not mechanized, that was not industrialized, that was not turned into public work, that remained private and familial work. And one example of that was um, doing grocery work. So I decided I would do a kind of time motion study, or not really even a motion study, a weight study, um, on the work that I do when I go grocery shopping. Because um, this is work, when you think about Frederick Winslow Taylor, the guy who did all those time studies at, oh, yeah. in the factories and, yeah. you know, measuring, you know, who moved what from where and how to change our machines so there's less actual human muscle power and effort being expended and you can increase productivity. I started thinking about, all right, what happens when I go grocery shopping? And, of course, this started because I was in the middle of a writing deadline. I was going crazy. I had little kids at home, family of four. Somebody had to go get the groceries. And it was me who had to break out of my actual work that I get paid for and go out there and buy groceries and schlep them home and, you know, deal with that. So I started calculating, all right, so what, um, what, um, what, how many times... Do I pick up the things that I buy and move them from one place to another? And then how much do does the total weight of these things weigh? And if I multiply them by the number of times that I pick them up and put them uh, and move them to some place, pick them up again and move it, um, then I'll know, you know, how much I um, weight I'm carrying in the course of a, a week's grocery shopping. Oh. And then, you know, multiply that by 52 times and, and so I'll know what I'm carrying per year. And I'm not going to go through all of the math with you, but I'll just say, you know, if you think about the fact that you take it off the shelf, then you take it out of the cart, put it in the conveyor belt, then you pick it up out of, you know, then you pick the bags up out of the cart and put them in the car and then you unload them out of the car and then you have to put them away. That's five times. That And I was averaging about 100 pounds of groceries a week for my yes. family. So that's 500 pounds a week, you know. And then if you multiply that by 52 weeks a year, I ended up with something like 12 and a half tons <laughs> of grocery God, shopping. Jesus Christ. You know? Unpaid and grocery shopping. And, yes, unpaid, you know, hefting of stuff. And this without having actually gotten anything back out to make dinner. Right. Oh my God. You know, so there's a whole extra set of processes that go into that. And I'm just saying, you know, this is the kind of uncounted stuff that we do. And th- this is work that is not just consuming things in this kind of passive and parasitic way. This is labor that produces things. It yeah. produces families. It enables families to reproduce themselves. It yes. enables us all to go to the work, to school, to wherever the next day. The same could be said with transportation, which is something I've been thinking about a lot, about the you know women as producers of a the world's greatest private transportation network, you know, when they're schlepping their kids around to soccer practice yeah. and school and, and all that kind of thing, which for many years went uncounted as well. So there's a lot of just sort of Things that are so ubiquitous that they're almost invisible to us, and I have a really good time looking at those things. And so all of that effort really keeps everybody going and makes possible the big things and the little things and all the stuff in between. If you didn't have that kind of effort in that context by those human beings, none of the other stuff would happen. I mean, sure, you could go get a donut or something, but after a while... You know, I mean, life gets, you know, you couldn't do anything else but do that stuff. But there's a, a so I'm, I'm really, you know, deeply ignorant about, about this, and, and I don't want to be any longer. So I'm, I'm thinking really, okay, so when one thinks about pollution, when one thinks about 
the enormously pressing problems that have really happened to us, you know, really only in the last 150 years. Uh, you know, we never had space debris until 19, 1957 when Sputnik went up. So we're we're dealing with this gigantic explosion of waste, um, and we don't know how to handle it. We don't know how to think about it. Uh, we certainly don't know how to stop it. So if you only look at human, human behavior uh, from one part of humanity and leave out everybody else, what is this the kind of trouble that it gets you into? I'm glad you mentioned donuts. <laughs> Because I tend to think, think, again, in terms of like mundane stuff, right? And when you said, um, is this, you know, if we didn't do these kinds of things, you know, how would we get from day to day? And the answer to that is more and more we're not, okay? Oh, so right. More and more so right. when we have multiple workers in any household, when we have people, I, I teach in a, uh, an environmental history class and I also teach a class on the history of food which I've gotten really, really interested in, food in American history, food in American history and landscape. And um, nowadays, everybody, and I have my students keep a week-long diary of um, where they went and why they went there and um, where they ate. Okay, Wonderful. so it's it is so illuminating because, of course, they live all over Albuquerque. At some point, they all have to get to the university, but most of them have jobs. They have families. They have roommates. Very few of them live walking distance from campus. Some do. Uh, few take the bus, but almost all of them at some point or another are using an automobile. And in many cases, they have multiple places they have to be in a given day. They have at least one other destination. But think about it. They have to do the grocery shopping. There's schlepping of children. There's all, you know, church um, and and any kind of cultural or leisure activity. Some of them have two jobs. Some of them have one car where they're picking up somebody else. Some households have four or five cars in them. So they're all this multiplication of people having to be in many places on any given day. And what that ends up meaning is you're spending more and more time getting yourself from here to there in a very expert and sophisticated and thoughtful and sometimes frantic but really knowledgeable way and that squeezes food preparation and um, and the kind of stuff that kind of keeps a family together. And it squeezes people really having a kind of knowledge about food that enables them to plan healthy meals for themselves or that enables them to uh, consume at home. So the truly efficient thing to do in a world like that is to grab a donut. Sure. is to go to the drive through is to hit McDonald's on your way from your last class at UNM on your way to get the kid at the daycare center, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so everybody gets a happy meal on the way, you know, and it's not a very happy thing. And it's not because people are stupid or lazy that we do these things. It's because we have constructed our world in such a way that we kind of almost hypervalue this fantasy of a hearth and a home that is a very gendered thing, that is separate from all these other places that we have to be, and we're not paying attention to the kind of work that everybody has to do in all of this. So for me, it's not ultimately a question of, you know, here's what men are doing and here's what women are doing, and it's always separate and it's always different. But if we take into account historically the stuff we've noticed and the stuff we haven't, the stuff we valued and the stuff that we haven't, we end up with a world in which people are doing more things in order to cope with the unintended consequences of those old patterns. Oh and I think if we can take those things into account, that's the only way we can begin to unravel a car culture that is contributing to climate change. It's the only way we can unravel a food culture that is contributing to an obesity epidemic. So there are a lot of things that are kind of second-order consequences of unintended or un, unconsidered, uh, unconscious kinds of scripts. And I guess all I'm arguing for is to, to foreground those kinds of things and really think them through from beginning to end and think about what kind of a world, not necessarily that we could sustain, because I think we can, even with fossil fuels running out, we can sustain this kind of crazy everybody eats in the car world for a time longer. Mm -hmm. The question is, is that what we want? Is that really what we desire? And I think that's a question that's a more important one to ask. If we begin this, this 
this conversation with uh, questions about the male generic, and if if we're if we're thinking about language and the causative relationships that that language have in our world, uh, we can't really think about a desired future unless uh, it includes all of us in detail as we are and as we are are evolving. So how so changing. Changing language, creating almost a new language, because uh, when you mess around with n nouns and adjectives, particularly adjectives, you're messing around with a whole lot. Uh, Rene Price says, my wife says, or, and her husband says, there's only one noun when it, when it comes to us, and that's human. Everything else is adjectives, and I think that's true in, in a lot of ways. But so, how how do you how do you get the language restructured somehow? to think, I want to say adequately or realistically, but practically about a desired future, and even to think what that might be. I'm enough of a kind of sucker for, um, I guess, advertising, that I believe that you, can, you will never persuade people to change their habits. You will never persuade them to accept different kinds of choices about how we are um, making use of our time on the planet and how we relate to other plants, animals, minerals, places, and people on the planet, unless you kind of hit them in a place that makes them hopeful and optimistic and makes them feel like they are using their power of choice and getting something that they want. So for me, the language of sustainability is never going to be adequate. It's never going to get people to change their behavior. And I think yeah. if you think about that from the point of view, not necessarily of people who have much, but maybe of people who have little. So I think about some work that I've done in kind of comparative um, environmental history and thinking about, uh, say, uh, women in Ghana who uh, make a little extra money um, actually boiling shea butter nuts to make shea butter, which then gets transported to the developed world to make cosmetics and to make shampoos and, and moisturizers and that kind of stuff. And these women, for many, many years, they've had to go out and gather fuel um, that is, you know, wood fuel. Um, the further and further they have to go from the village as they're, as they're deforesting with their gathering, uh, the more dangerous it is for them. The more hours they spend over a wood fire, the more kind of environmental health, or health problems that they have, their time, uh, their time, their energy, all that stuff. You can change that. You can change relations with the forest. You can change out some of their health kinds of consequences. And you can change out um, the, the time that they spend spent doing this work when you say um, give them an inexpensive propane burner for that work. I mean that's something that turns out to be a choice that we might say well you know this is a consumption of fossil fuels and that's a terrible thing but for them maybe the trade-off is something that creates incredibly instant change in their life and a really a desirable choice and they will say to you in the same way that a native woman you know faced with a, a fur trader or a trader um, along the Santa Fe Trail will say you know I want a knife to skin that bison because I'm really tired of working with stone scrapers you know yeah. a tool that I can use that will make my life instantly better we have to show people tools that will make their lives instantly better that they will then desire. So for me, a tool might be, you know, this tomato is going to taste a whole lot better than that thing you got at McDonald's. Don't you want a farmer's market in your neighborhood that will give you something that will taste that good? Yeah. Um, so I think you have to appeal to people at the level of the senses as well as at the level of the intellect. And, and I think we have a long way to go before we do that. And, and I hope we get there. So to sort of wrap it up a little bit, uh, um, uh, the language of sustainability is really, I'm beginning now to see, is the language of half, half the people. <laughs> what is the language of desirability? And how do, we, how do we build that? I think the language of a desirable future really engages uh, everybody from, from kids on up. So you have to begin by asking children, what would you want? in your world? Is it more important to you to, you know, think about when you're 16, I'm going to have my own car? Or is it more important to you to think about, you know, when I'm 16, I'm not going to have an endless summer where I'm going to be sweating my brains out all the time. 
right? So you have to really, I mean, you have to give people choices that in some ways make them feel a kind of bodily experience, make them feel important and appeal to their embodied experience of the world. I'm not sure exactly how we get there, and I think we have a long way to go with the transformation of nature, but I don't think we're going to get there when we aren't sure whether we belong to man or not. Uh, I think you, it has to be a language that engages everybody, and it has to be a language that assumes a conversation rather than a monologue. I want to thank you so very, very much for for being here with us today. It's just been a great joy, and I, boy, my my world has just exploded, and I thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure. Um.